So um, when John asked me to talk uh, to the town of Gown, I, I thought I would try to summarize my thoughts about the pandemic uh, and, and especially the medical and public health establishment and how, how it managed. And uh, uh, so I'll go through a few, a few ideas here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the kind of uh, really more medical and public health interventions and actions. And I've, I've, I've actually taken the liberty of grading components of the epidemic control measures. Uh, maybe this is a uh, venting frustration uh, after two years. Um, and of course, it's easy to be a critic after the fact, but I think we could learn from what we did right and what we did wrong. Now, a couple of things I'll not discuss are the politics of the pandemic. That's a separate question, a much uh, more complex question, but I won't get into that, nor, nor to how the public has behaved. It's really, I'm asking myself, what could we, as uh, those of us in medicine and public health, what did we do right or did we do wrong and what could we have done better? So uh, here's an outline. Uh, I'll first talk about public health measures, uh, such as closing public spaces, masking and distancing. And then I wanna talk quite a bit about public health leadership and public health communication. Uh, testing has been a, a, a very interesting topic. Vaccines, uh, treatments, uh, of which I will, I'm dividing into three categories. I'll get into that when I get to that part of the talk. And I'll kind of sum up with what we could have done better. So let's start with closing public spaces. I, I, I think this was had some merit, but was problematic right from the get-go uh, because closings, especially of schools, are very unpopular. And this attitude, this unpopularity, and this is part of the public health communication issue can spill over to other public health measures. I've thought since the beginning of the epidemic that if individual behavior, if adhered to, especially masking and distance, could enable schools to remain open. And in fact, we now have very good studies, uh, particularly a very large study from North Carolina, but also from many other parts of the country, that you can have schools be open if there is rigorous adherence, or at least the best attempt to rigorously adhere to masking and distancing. Might add a few other things like ventilation and uh, careful screening, but mostly masking and distancing, you can have open schools. So one of the things I think why I give it a B minus is because although there was reason to think that closing public spaces might be helpful, it had, uh, uh, it, 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 it began, a, I think, a chain of resistance to public health measures that, that affects other things. So I should say in the 1918 flu epidemic, which was actually looked at, the experiences to, to try to learn what we could. Uh, closing public places and canceling public event was shown to be effective in reducing spread. One of the more notable things that I found looking at the, the information that, that exists on the 1918 flu is that Philadelphia was really resistant to calling uh, to closing public places or to cancel a major World War I victory parade. And uh, shortly after that victory parade, it's, it's stunning to think of this. Philadelphia lost more than 1% of its total population in a single month, October, 1918, to the influenza of 1918. So you can imagine how powerful that, uh, those experiences were in influencing thinking about the current pandemic. So, no, 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 can I interrupt quickly? Uh, your, your slides um, aren't visible at the moment. Oh no, oh, well, why not? Um, they're here. visible. I can see them. Oh, so why, why? They're not moving along. It, I, 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 I've done, I, I can see it on my screen. My screen shows the slides. Did you put um, it in getting the, the viewing setting? Uh, okay. I can, we can Is see that, them. Some of us can see them. I can see three blue ones. It should be see. just, it should be just one, Jenny. Thanks for, for coming in. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure what to press. Uh, if there is a button, hi, Dr. Panath, hi, it's Madison. Yes. Um, if you disable, like, stop your screen share. Okay. Um, 
And then reshare and make sure you're sharing your entire desktop and not just the PowerPoint. Um, it should uh, change when we go to when you go to the presentation view. Aha. Uh -huh. Yep. Now we have new ones. Can people can people see this now? John? We can a uh, slide four of thirty. That's correct. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Can, can someone can someone give Madison Walsh a medal today? She's she's been <laughs> with us for a long time and she always gets it right. Thank you, Madison. Uh, I so appreciate it. Uh, gently. I, I say gently. Yeah, okay. So masking and distances, I give a uh, distance. I really do give a better grade. So I think it's really very fundamental. And I think, um, and avoiding crowded places, uh, which isn't the same as closing crowded places, it's just avoiding them are, are effective and important public health tools that have been important in this pandemic. But some buts, why it doesn't get an A. The early advice on masking was mixed, in part to preserve masks in short supply, which is understandable. There were really uh, only a few really good studies that showed the value of masking. So long into the pandemic, people were questioning the value of masking. But the few studies we did have, and there were some, were not really effectively publicized in the public health circles, I thought. We were pretty slow to realize that SARS-CoV-2 is an aerosolized virus, which makes it much more communicable than other forms of uh, 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 transmission in the atmosphere. And uh, also the differences between indoor and outdoor protections took a while to, to resolve. And of, and of course, only recently have we been really talking seriously about the different types of masks. So we were a little behind the eight ball on masking, but overall, I think it was a, a, an effective public health intervention. Now here, we get into a pet topic of mine, during a pandemic, few, few things are more important than effective public health communication. And our historical source of that at the national level has been the Centers for Disease Control. And frankly, at the federal level, I talked first about federal and then about local public health, the CDC did not establish its policy developing authority. Uh, Trump CDC Director Robert Redfield, no doubt acting on White House orders, abandoned the CDC leadership role. And in fact, although I don't think this is well known outside of public health cir circles, Redfield received enormous criticism from the public health community. Uh, for example, more than 100 former Epidemic Intelligence Service officers, Epidemic Intelligence Service officers, those young, usually physicians, but also PhDs, who go down to the CDC and then are sent to to control outbreaks wherever they go spend two or three years there and come back and it's part of their so more than a hundred of them some very well-known people wrote a joint letter to complain and really urging redfield to resign if he couldn't do better and then and i'll quote from this a little bit perhaps even more damaging uh, a, a private letter from former cdc director bill fagy Bill Fage is one of the real giants of 20th century public health a major figure in smallpox eradication was scathingly critical and uh, uh, it became public. I, I think, uh, I'm not quite sure how it became public, but it certainly was circulated widely, it was on Facebook. And uh, I'll show you a little bit from what Fagy said to Robert Redfield. So communication has been much improved under Rochelle Walensky, but I still don't think the CDC has fully asserted its public health leadership role. Uh, here's, here's page one of the letter uh, sent in September, 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm not revealing anything. It's public in many circles. Uh, uh, and, and, and Bill Fagy writes to Robert Redfield, Dear Bob, I start each day thinking about the terrible burden you bear. I don't know what I would actually do if I was in your position, but I do know what I wish I could do. The first thing would be to face the truth. You and I both know that despite the White House spin attempts, this will go down as a colossal failure of, public health, of the public health system in our country. The biggest challenge in a century and will let the country down. The public health text of the future will use this as a lesson on how not to handle an infectious disease epidemic. This is pandemic. This is coming from Bill Fagy. I, I, I can't tell you how, in what awe Bill Fagy is, is, is held in, in public health circles for his work. A former director of the CDC himself, and also probably the major intellectual figure in the smallpox eradication campaign. The cause will be the incompetence and logic of the White House program, 
The White House has had no hesitation to blame and disgrace CDC, you and the state governors. They'll blame you for the disaster in six months you've caused CDC to go from gold to tarnished brass and so on and so forth. Uh, a violation of every lesson learned in the last 75 years of public health. I, I don't think it can get more sharp than this. I don't know if Redfield responded. I know nothing. He was still in, in head, head of the CDC until pretty much the last day of the Trump administration. So uh, I'm not alone in giving uh, a D to the public health communication. Now, also public health works at the state and local level. And Michigan has historically had a very strong and very active public health department. But I feel unfortunately we too in Michigan have faltered in public health messaging in the epidemic. Uh, the leadership has been unstable. We've had during the pandemic, two directors of public health. We've had two chief medical officers. And we really haven't had a spokesperson for public health in our state who would insist on, 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 on giving the right message and, and counteracting the, the bad messages that go on. Um, uh, I should say that um, in, uh, well, I'll talk about this later, but I'll just mention briefly now that I spent some time in the summer in the state of Vermont and Vermont's uh, health director is a man by the name of Mark Levine. And he has a one hour every week radio program on Vermont Public Radio and a call-in program. And everybody could answer. I've actually personally told the governor this and urged her to institute the same thing. I'm sure WKR would give uh, our public health spokesperson in the state, head director of public health, Elizabeth Hertel or whoever, time to talk and take call-ins. We need people to state what is right and what is not right during a pandemic. And instead we've had a, a cacophony of voices. I must say at the county level, I think Ingham has had very strong leadership from Linda Vale, and particularly on the issue of school masking requirements against much opposition. There are at least five studies I know of in which schools which require masking and schools that don't require masking are compared. And there's no doubt that masking is effective in reducing clusters of, epidemic, of, of outbreaks in schools and in uh, children of school age. Testing. Uh, unfortunately, I have to give a seat to testing. The failure to gear up testing was a critical public health failure in the early months. And uh, if you look at countries like Taiwan and South Korea that really got the testing going quickly, testing many people, the, 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 the first phase of the epidemic, which was dramatically different in those countries. Of course, as you may remember, the CDC's first tests were inaccurate. The transition to in-home testing took more than a year. We've only recently begun to have much in the way of in-home testing. They still have too many false negatives, so that technology is not robust yet. And frankly, the current federal rollout of mass testing is a bit late in the game. So vaccines. Now, I, uh, I think here I give an A minus. The development of the messenger RNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna was indeed a great breakthrough deserving of an A. I give it an A minus because of the two difficulties of, that have emerged with both vaccines, uh, waning immunity. In other words, it's not as long lasting as we would wish. And also um, that uh, the failure to prevent in infection and not just um, disease. Certainly uh, we would like a vaccine to also cut down on communicability and therefore we'd like it to prevent uh, lesser infections in some vaccines it does that, not all. Um, uh, uh, and uh, then I want to comment on one little thing. It's a bit of an aside, uh, but much has been made of how uniquely quickly the vaccine was studied in the field. Now, this was used both by supporters of the vaccine, say, look, isn't this wonderful? We did this. You know, that's one thing the Trump administration uh, spoke, uh, spoke about that they had reason to, to, to feel good about, which is how rapidly a vaccine was, was developed and, and field tested. Um, and also by opponents who said, oh, this is too fast. You know, it must, must be something wrong. We can't accept a, a vaccine that suddenly appeared. And the, the interesting thing about this argument is that the vaccine studies were not uniquely rapid. In fact, um, I will show you some data from my, one of my favorite studies of all time, which is the 1954 field trial of the, pol of the Salk polio vaccine. Which you may, which you should, we should all feel proud to know, was conducted in our state. It was led by uh, the University of Michigan, Thomas Francis, the great 
head of epidemiology, the great infectious disease epidemiologist, a wonderful figure, uh, led it. And uh, 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 it turns out, I will show you for those of you who are historically interested, here's a copy that I have, copy I have is signed by Tommy Francis. I feel very proud of that. Uh, uh, but I wanna show you some, uh, some, some data about it. Uh, was the Pfizer trial remarkably fast now? because the Pfizer trial was first out of the gate, as you know, um, it really did quite a remarkable thing. It gave 44,000 or some adults two shots over a period of three months. So that's pretty impressive. Until you consider that the uh, field trial of the Salk vaccine gave more than 600,000 children three shots in six weeks. I mean, suddenly the Pfizer trial doesn't seem so extraordinary, does it? Hmm. The Pfizer trial reported its results uh, after following the participants for an average of 15 and a half weeks, exactly 13 and a half months after the first shot. And there was a preliminary report after just following the first six weeks after vaccination, which was published only four and a half months after the first shot, which is pretty remarkable. But the SALT trial reported its final results on, are you ready for this, 1.8 million children because there were groups of children who were not vaccinated were being followed for their risk of polio. Uh, after following the participant for an average of seven months, just less than a year after the first shot was given, less than a year, April, 1955. Uh, it, it's, um, and by the way, they didn't have electronic computers, among other things. They used IBM card sort machines. Um, so, you know, Let's have a little humility, you know, in relation to the past. We, we're not the only people who did great things. Great things were done in the past, too. So now I'm going to move a bit into treatments and uh, COVID treatments. And I'll give you an overview of treatments. And I'm speaking now of specific treatments for COVID. I'm not talking about the general management of patients in hospitals, how you do ventilators and what's the right a set of procedures using general medical uh, techniques. I'm talking about the ones specific to COVID. So COVID-19 has two phases, an early viral phase and a later inflammatory phase. And the viral phase covers the first few days after symptoms develop. And fortunately for most pe people, that's where it ends. But after some, anywhere from three to seven, maybe to 10 days in the viral phase, some patient, patients develop severe lung disease as a result of the powerful inflammatory response they mount, it's sometimes referred to as a cytokine storm or you know, just a, a massive uh, reaction to the virus that in fact is itself probably damaging to the lungs especially. Now there are two kinds of agents that target the viral phase, the early phase. They're chemical and biological. They're useful in the early phase before too much inflammation is set in. Whereas Another set of drugs, anti-inflammatory agents, target the latter phase of the disease and, in fact, might be harmful if given too soon. Uh, the problem is that this timing issue got kind of forgotten about uh, by much of medicine during the pandemic, and I'll show you how it affected the, the randomized trials that were done. So let me just go into these biologic antivirals. There are three kinds. Uh, and the principle of all three is to provide antibody to patients to supplement the antibody they're producing themselves. This is sometimes referred to as passive antibody uh, treatment. Uh, the one you know you've heard of most probably are the monoclonal antibodies, which are engineered in a laboratory to react to one component, one clone of the viral agent. Convalescent plasma, which I was have been very heavily involved in, is taking antibodies from someone who just recovered it from the disease and giving them to, the, to a patient. And the third one, which hasn't played much of a role in this pandemic is the hyperimmune globulins, which are distilled antibodies from convalescent plasma given as an IM shot. That takes some manufacturing to do. There's uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the first two are intravenous products. The third can be given as a shot in the muscle. So uh, let's talk about those, those two, those virological agents. Monoclonals were shown effective in outpatients, but not in inpatients. That's interesting. That is the right way to test them. They were properly tested in outpatients. And, uh, 
And they didn't work in inpatient, which makes sense because it's too late in the disease course. Uh, supply has been a problem. And of course, their effectiveness against Om Omicron is uncertain. When I wrote this, I said uncertain, but actually yesterday the FDA issued an announcement saying they, most of the uh, monoclonals should not be used now because they are really, they think, ineffective against Omicron. Uh, so what you know that's the, that's the difficulty of, uh, of of a monoclonal product. It's one clone. It has one specific target. It's too precise, if you will. Now we in the early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of enthusiasm, surprisingly, a lot of enthusiasm for convalescent plasma, and we we have done some work to show that by October 2020, about 40 percent of inpatients were receiving convalescent plasma. Now, unfortunately. Inpatients is not where it really belongs. It belongs in outpatients, but I'll get to that more details in a moment. The trials in very the trials rolled down. Then then some trials began to come out. The randomized trials of convalescent plasma, and they were in hospitalized patients where it would not be expected to show effectiveness, particularly in the severe end of hospitalized patients. And they had a terrible effect on the usage of convalescent plasma. They were uniformly negative, particularly the very large recovery trial from Great Britain, which was a trial in people who are very, very sick, 24% mortality overall. Uh, and, uh, and by March, 2021, only 10% of hospitalized patients were getting convalescent plasma. We have two trials now uh, in our patients, which are very effect showed very good effectiveness, but unfortunately the FDA has approved convalescent plasma only for inpatients and for outpatients, only if they have an immunosuppressive disorder. Uh, there was a little trial, uh, one trial done of hyperimmunoglobulin. It was also done in sick inpatients at the wrong time, and it didn't improve outcomes, and it's not even yet published. Antiviral agents include chemical agents. Now, early in the epidemic, some fairly good evidence emerged from benefit from remdesivir if given early in the disease. There's more evidence later that it works also later in the disease. Later in the epidemic, we did uh, learn of two drugs that seem to stave off progression, Paxlovid uh, and Malnupiravir. Uh, unfortunately, um, there's really not that much information on them, even though the FDA has approved them. The uh, neither one has had a published trial in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, Paxlovid, we know only really from data released by the drug company, uh, and Molnupiravir the same. Now, <clears throat> uh, and, and even though, and even so, even though they've been approved, the access to Paxlovid has been very limited. So, um, again, we haven't really fully, I think, taken advantage of what we have. Uh, another part of the chemical agents used in convalescent plasma that really bears a lot of criticism is the extraordinary use of drugs where there was no evidence that they should work. In particular, for some reason, uh, two drugs that are effective in parasitic disease got picked on, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. First, it was, it, it was I, I knew that there was uh, enthusiasm for hydroxychloroquine based on very strange studies and they were you know, promoted by the White House. But I was stunned to find out that even in big hospitals in New York, something like 40 or 50% of all patients were getting it. I didn't think our physicians were so susceptible to reading the newspaper and deciding what to treat their patients with. Again, ivermectin didn't quite have quite as much of a, of a, of a, of a, of a run as hydroxychloroquine, but still being often given without any serious evidence of effectiveness. So the, 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 the drug, the use of chemicals and biological agents has been very, very uh, imperfect. Uh, now we turn to the anti-inflammatories and I give that a better grade because <clears throat> they really are effective in the advanced stage of the disease. Uh, mostly, uh, it's mostly corticosteroids and they target this immune response, this exuberant immune response, sometimes called the cytokine storm. And that seems to be implicated in much severe illness. Uh, and uh, they were shown effective uh, in several trials in severely ill patients. It, it's understandable that medicine started to do trials in the very sick, oh, because the very sick are who you worry about most. But 
And for steroids, that was a godsend because those are the ones in whom it was going to work. For a convalescent plasma for monoclonals, not such a good idea. Uh, but in fact, it's important to know from the largest trial that involved more than 6,000 patients, one of the arms of the recovery trial in Great Britain, uh, they say there was no evidence that dexamethasone provide any benefit among patients who were not receiving respiratory support at randomization. And the results were consistent with possible harm in this subgroup. In other words, people are not that sick, not, you, not on oxygen, getting steroids, it's not such a good idea. They had an elevated risk of dying, not quite statistically significant. Uh, I've asked my colleagues in, in, in New York, uh, is, how many people are getting steroids who are not that sick? And I, I get the unfortunate response, all, all of them. Um, so there's an overuse of steroids in the mildly ill that is not justifiable by the results of trials. Still, it is effective in advanced disease. So what we have with the therapies, we have the kind of inappropriate therapeutics. The antiviral agents consistently show signals of effectiveness when used early in the course of disease, the first few days of illness. Uh, the best trials have studied people who are um, outpatients and who might be at risk of progressing to severe disease, say they may be older, they may have underlying conditions, and, uh, and it works quite well in, in, in reducing the risk of progression of disease, uh, uh, both of them, both monoclonals and convalescent plasma. But all too often, especially convalescent plasma has been used in very sick patients, and, and that's not when patients can most benefit from it. And by contrast, steroids, work best in very sick patients, but clinicians who are very comfortable with steroids, it's widely used in medicine, are using them also in patients who are not that sick. So this, this inconsistency has been one of the unfortunate uh, part of the picture of therapeutics in, in, in the pandemic. So here's what I, I, I'm summarizing all my grades here. I, public health measures overall a C plus because I think masking and distancing has been the best thing that Leadership and policy making has been very weak. Uh, testing imperfect vaccines by far the best thing we did in the whole epidemic. And actually, treatments have been a bit up and down, uh, uh, not as good as we would wish them to be. Uh, um, so, thinking about it all, what could public health have done better? What could medicine have done better? Well. I think at the federal level, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the present situation. Even now, uh, the White House pref has preferred to work with the National Institutes of Health, which is not a public health agency, in setting its agenda, not just for science, but for public health. The White House, I think, should maintain the separation of authority. The Centers for Disease Control for Public Health, the NIH for Biomedical Medical Scientific Issues, and, uh, uh, and much as I admire Dr. Fauci, and I really am a big supporter, 100% supporter, because he, he wouldn't be, the, I, I think we should have more of a balance between Dr. Walensky and Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci should be especially involved in questions that NIH hasn't really talked much about, like therapeutics and uh, 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 how you and, and and of course the the in fact the the, the 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 treatment the prevention in individual patients but for the public health point of view the broader perspective the community aspects i think we should be trying to empower the centers for disease control and state public health agencies and i think state and, and local public health is very important really all public health is local frankly uh and, um, you know, how many of you know our current public health leadership, uh, whose names I've mentioned in slide eight? I mean, unfortunately, they're not well known. That, that suggests we have a problem when people don't know who is in charge of our public health effort in our state. And I think we need, during a pandemic, regular and consistent communication about the status of infections, the status of hospitalizations and deaths, and their vaccination status. I would like it if the state health department would announce every, every week how many people died in Michigan and how, what fraction of them were unvaccinated. It might wake some people up because in fact, 95, as you probably all know, 90 to 95% of everybody that all, all across the country dying of COVID these days are unvaccinated people. And it's tragic, it's a tragic preventable loss of life. 
Uh, and as I said before, the Vermont Public Health Director has an hour-long call uh, every hour on Vermont Public Radio, which is very informative for the public. Medicine, uh, as noted before, this pandemic has spawned a great deal of use of drugs that don't work, often prescribed not just by freaky people, but by legitimate practitioners. And uh, effective treatments haven't always been matched to the right stage of the disease. I feel that NIH, who should have been in the leadership in trials, left actually trials to physicians in the community, stepping in a bit late to help out. It was a long, took a long while for us to get uh, NIH to really support some of the trial efforts in the United States. Britain and Canada did rather better in that regard. And I think we have to have educational programs to be mounted in the medical community to ensure appropriate use of all available tools. I have to say there's been a remarkable uh, disdain for convalescent plasma. I don't know quite where it comes from. Guidance panels, it's uh, the WHO, even the NIH advisory panels on, 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 on drugs have really understated the value of convalescent plasma. Plasma, the most striking thing was when JAMA published a review of convalescent plasma in which most of the data was taken from a news release of an unpublished study. I think that's unprecedented in, in medicine, certainly in JAMA. And uh, also not really thinking about the whole picture overall uh, has been a major disappointment to us. And you, I might add that just yesterday when it was announced that by the FDA that they didn't want monoclonals to be used, they suggested, well, you could still use, and they mentioned some of the medications I've described before, none of which, <laughs> none of which have as much behind them as outpatient use of convalescent plasma, which was not mentioned. So there seems to be a kind of strange resistance to this particular kind of, is it too old fashioned? Is it too uh, uh, 19th and 20th century, really, the convalescent plasma was first used in 1890? Um, is it not jazzy enough? Is there no pharmaceutical company benefiting from it? These are questions one could ask. I don't have the answers. All right. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions uh, uh, if you like. Thank you, Dr. Fanner. Um, if any of you uh, are not comfortable speaking out and asking questions, you can put it up in the chat box and I can read it out for you. And if you want to speak out over Zoom, you can use the raise hand function. No questions as yet. Um, Thank you. I'm trying. Uh, Marina Wilson, is, is it Marina? Am I reading it right? You're, 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 you're muted, or is it Marna? Sorry, it's Marna. Marna. I, I was seeing a doctor who I'm no longer seeing who, um, told me that he had he does not recommend vaccinations for patients because unless they have uh, comorbidities because he believes that getting covid is the best thing to do and you have much higher immunity if you get covid instead of getting a vaccine i'm not seeing him anymore and i'm fully vaccinated and boosted but where did that come from and how valid is that you know i it's again, the source of the kind of gross misinformation that gentlemen ought to be disbarred or to be defrocked or whatever you do in medicine, reported to the state licensing authorities. That is such terrible information. Uh, this is a disease with uh, a 3% overall mortality rate. And uh, right now we see what's happening. We see people who are unvaccinated, who are following that doctor's advice, dying in droves. 2,000 people a day are dying in the United States of COVID, even now. 18 months into the epidemic year after the vaccines were developed, 2,000 people dying, virtually all of them unnecessarily. 90 to 95% are unvac unvaccinated. 
And among the vaccinated, most of the people dying are people who are immunodeficient and respond poorly to vaccines. People who are on chemotherapy for cancer, people who are, uh, have had organ transplants, people who are, uh, have autoimmune disorders and take some medications which interfere with their development of immunity. So, uh, I mean, let's, uh, Colin Powell was like that. He had multiple myeloma, which itself affects immunity. And then so does, um, uh, so does uh, the treat, sort of the treatments. So he succumbed, uh, even though he'd been fully vaccinated because he had an inability to fully respond to vaccines because of his disorder. Uh, Arthur and Ronit, how can ordinary people distinguish a doctor as another opinion and outright kook doctors? Now, this is, of course, the central problem of our time. Who do you trust? Who has the good housekeeping seal of approval? Where do you get your information from? Uh, I know where I get my information from. I get them from the medical literature and especially the, the appropriate journals, uh, the good journals, um, the CDC, state health departments, county health departments. Uh, and, and I think people who are in official positions who ought to know are, are the people you should listen to. Uh, if you, if you, if you said to that doctor of Marna's who doesn't recommend vaccinations, are there any, uh, can you point me to any major organizations, uh, the American Medical Association, National Institutes of Health, CC, who agree with you? Can you find can you find even so much as a local health department, a county health, 3,000 county health departments in the US, approximately? Can you find me one county health department website that says don't vaccinate people? Just one among 3,000? No. I mean, really, uh, uh, I don't know. What do you say? The vaccine will change their DNA. The vaccine cannot change your DNA. End of discussion. It's messenger RNA. It's not DNA. Messenger, it doesn't enter into the area where it doesn't enter the nucleus of the cell. Messenger RNA does its work, goes to the ribosome, tells you to make a protein, and then disappears. It's the most evanescent thing in, that we have in that we measure. Most people say, I can't measure mRNA. Where is it? We can't get it. We can't. It's, 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 it's total nonsense. Um, I'm saying I, think I should go back up a little bit because I think they're coming. Coming, the long-term prognosis for myocarditis, the myocarditis data so far. First of all, you can get myocarditis from COVID, and you can get myocarditis from the vaccine. You are ten times more likely to get myocarditis from COVID than from the vaccine. The risk of myocarditis is much higher with COVID. Mr. Hmm. Mr. Vaccine Doctor, there. That's one thing. Secondly. The studies have shown, I know I've seen one series of 300 people, mostly for some reason, adolescent males, who have had uh, the myocarditis. Not a single one was hospitalized. It has disappeared after a few weeks. It's not been a severe complication. That doesn't mean that it hasn't been used to exaggerate uh, by the anti-vaxxers, just like uh, uh, claims of autism after measles vaccination you know, hampered measles vaccination efforts. Um, let me see, Emma, let's make sure I want to go. How would I improve the status of public health? Oh my God. Spokesman, is that training in medicine, the training communications, their ability to interact with politicians who have power over their positions? You know, I've been watching public health for many decades now. Uh, and I have seen strong public health. I actually, <laughs> I actually said this, if you'll forgive me, to one of the officials that I spoke to, I said, you know what I think I ought to do? I ought to call Maury Risen. I know there are people on this call who know who Maury Risen is. Maurice Risen was the last physician director of public health in the state of Michigan in the 1970s. It's been 50 years since we've had a physician in charge of, as a director of public health. Well, I'm not going to say so that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's a fact. Maury, God bless him, is still alive at 101. And I happen to think that Maury at 101 might make a, a more powerful spokesperson for public health than anyone we have right now. In his day, he, he would get up and say what it was. You know, he was, 
when we were having the PCB problems in Michigan, the PBB problems. I mean, it's possible to be a strong public health leader to say outright what the truth is, you know, and 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 say, say well, what is and what isn't. And I, I think you need that. And I think there is public health communication is in itself a discipline. Uh, we actually have in Michigan State a, a pretty good uh, um, uh, health communications group. And I really would like to see people learn, but I, I'm not sure it's something you, you learn from a book. I think you just have to say, listen, this is the way it is, you know? Uh, Molly, Molly has her hand up. Thanks, I tried to get myself off mute. So one of my concerns, and thank you immensely for all your information. One of my concerns was the, <clears throat> here to, before 2020, the, everyone in the world would have looked to the United States for how do we manage this program? Yes. How are we going to get that back? Oh. I mean, this is it. I think the CDC has taken such a hit and it was because frankly of Redfield, uh, mm -hmm. I, because he wasn't able, not that he's a bad person, he just wasn't able to assert the authority of public health in the face of uh, what was happening in the White House. And, and, and he was afraid to contradict. People were fired at the CDC. People were told to shut up. Meetings were canceled. All sorts of garbage happened under his watch. He wasn't able to simply stand up and say, no, stop this. We are in charge of public health. You have to listen to us. And he was unable to do that. Uh, I think if Bill Fagey had been head of the CDC, this would not have happened. Uh, he would have just done what he did and, and he would have, you know, he might have been fired, but he would have been fired with enough noise so the country would know what was going on. Uh, I, I, I think there's no substitute simply for leadership uh, in, in public health. Thank you. I had here the rest of his letter. Uh, <laughs> I, if you want to see it. Um, uh, well, is the rest of the world going to rely on us again? I think it's going to be years before we re regain the CDC's status as a leader in public health internationally. I think the WHO has behaved more sensibly, not always perfectly, but a little more sensibly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the head of WHO uh, has been has been a solid solid citizen. He's he's, he's said the right things. Uh, there has been a fair amount of effectiveness in getting vaccines out to third world countries. Not as much as we would wish, but at least not nothing. Um, I, I, I think the um, uh, yeah, I think I think the CDC has taken a huge hit. It's gonna it's gonna take such a long time. And it, you know, to those of us who grew up, you know, admiring the CDC and admiring what it did and the people who worked there. And they're still, it's still full of great people. Make no mistake, the, the yeah. CDC has great people, solid public health officials, great scientists, but reputation, unfortunately, uh, is, is more, it's more difficult to earn than to lose. It's not so hard to lose your reputation and to earn it back <laughs> take a while. Thanks. Very disappointing. Oh, there's some more messages that I haven't seen yet. I'm sorry. I do, didn't we find... go... Yes, go ahead. Can you mind on sharing your screen uh, just so we can see more people and then it's easier to see hands when they're raised? Oh, so I should, I should stop sharing? Oh, please. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm, you know, I need Madison in the room with me to help me <laughs> make sure I don't make mistakes. I'm uh, still here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madison. Uh, okay, now I see, didn't Pfizer, Nancy, hi, Nancy, didn't Pfizer largely go its own way in developing vaccine rather than being part of the president's warp, warp, warp plan? What were the reasons for their independence? Now, here's an interesting thing. I think, uh, uh, yes, well, first of all, I think they did get, no matter what they said, they did get a fair amount of chunk of cash from the federal government. Uh, uh, I don't, maybe not as quite the same as other, as, as, as Moderna, but they did. And, I, and uh, uh, I, I think drug companies, you know, in a pandemic, uh, drug companies are in actually in a very strong position because they can mount a trial faster than anyone can. They have all the resources, they have money, 
they have uh, clinical trial units all ready to go. They have just, you know, they can get it started. If, if I wanted to start a, a trial as an academic, which is what a lot of the, say, for example, convalescent plasma trials were done by academics, I have to start to write a grant to NIH or figure out who can fund me and so on and so forth. And uh, so they can jump right out ahead and they did, and they did very well with both uh, the vaccines and also with the monoclonals in the early days. Although, as we said before, monoclonal, and I thought so at the time, you know, monoclonals were developed to have one clone, to attack one part of a cell. They haven't been used much in infectious disease. They've mostly been used in cancer or autoimmune disorders. Now, and, and, and I said, what will happen when the next mutation comes in? And sure enough, they know the, the monoclonals or even biclonals, because sometimes they put two together. It's just not enough. Convalescent plasma contains a whole messy, messy mishmash of antibodies. Hopefully one of them will be good for you. That's the whole idea. In fact, we find that local plasma is much better than distant plasma, probably because it's closer to the strain that's circulating in your neighborhood. So, um, uh, I think this, this notion of if we engineer it precisely, it's better versus it's kind of messy, but the, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. You know, that's considered a little bit, not the best kind of science, but I, I think in, in this pandemic, it might be the opposite. Yeah. So um, let's see, have I, I'm not going to try. So I don't really know what Pfizer's logic w was, but I think they, they got money anyway. Uh, let me see who else is there. Oh, oh, okay. Are there any more questions? Did I not? Did not? Uh, oh, thank who, who? Judy, thank you for referencing Maury. He was remarkable. He is remarkable. God bless him. And in private conversation, what would you say to the governor of Florida, ladies and gentlemen? What I would say to the governor of Florida cannot be said in public. It's not printable. I would just say, I mean, what planet did you step off? I mean, I just, I do not get people like that who not only, not only don't support public health measures, but want to interfere with public health measures, which is, to my mind, it's, it's, uh, it's like somebody standing on a cliff and, 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 and you're pushing them over instead of holding them back. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, I, I'll say this uh, over and over again. Every day in the United States, 2,000 people are dying of COVID, 90% at least unvaccinated. I'll say this for as often as I can so people listen. If that doesn't make you, what precisely are you afraid of that's worse than that? You got something, you, 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 what you do, a sore arm? Is that, is that the thing? Allergic reaction? I mean, what? I, I just don't get it. I completely don't get it. Forgive my frustration. Please answer Kurt Demars Johnson question about five years old and younger. Now, let me see that. I missed it. Okay. I'm a pediatrician, so I'm interested in that kind of question. Oh. Ah, here we go. Suspected side effects for mRNA vax for five-year-olds and younger. Are trials going uh, right now for this age group? Yes, there are trials going on. Uh, I think what happened... They had a setback because, not because of side effects, but because the vaccine, the dosage they felt was insufficient and that they were not getting the antibody responses they had hoped for. So they decided to change the trial and increase the dosage. I know it's going on. I know I have friends at Henry Ford uh, uh, who are involved in the trial. I have a friend in Madison, Wisconsin involved in the trial. So it is going on. And I think before too long, we will have a vaccine for two to five-year-olds. I don't think they've gone below two. Now, that would be great. And I you know I, I don't have any reason to think that side effects would be more common in, in infants, in, in small children. Um, but it's disappointing to me that the five to 11-year-olds for whom the vaccine is licensed are not getting vaccinated enough. Uh, now, people always say, well, you know, kids don't get that sick with COVID. Well, but some kids do, you know. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't know what the threshold is. More than a thousand children have died of COVID. More than a thousand in this pandemic. When we introduced the measles vaccine in 1965 or six, 500 kids a year were dying of measles. Did that matter? Did, 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 was that okay? Was it okay to have 500 deaths a year from measles? I don't think so. And we managed to get rid of that. We have no deaths from measles. Zero in the United States. 
And uh, so I don't see, I don't understand the logic of 500 deaths a year from COVID in children is not that big a deal. You know, uh, that's 500 great tragedies. Yes, if, if, you, if, if the, 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 the individual incidence is not that high as it was in measles, the individual likelihood of any child dying from measles is about one in a thousand in, uh, in, 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 a, in a high income country, much more so by the way, in low income countries. But, uh, but uh, we decided sensibly to, to, to introduce the measles vaccine in 1966 and we got rid of the damn thing almost just about entirely. So I, uh, I, I think the trials will come out you know, later than we had hoped, but they will come out fairly soon and we'll be able to uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to vaccinate the younger kids, but we have to have people willing to vaccinate their children. And the resistance to, to vaccination in children it just uh, astonishes me. Oh, Dr. Tan, there's a question. If you get, as of right now, if you get the Omicron variant, what treatment do you think? Depends on the circumstance. If you're early in the illness, you know, it's just, just begun, and, uh, and you haven't uh, real um, uh, any risk of progressing. Here's the, the important question. A lot of people are going to be mildly or they, they, you know, they, they have nothing going on. I mean, but people who are older, people who have uh, cardiac or pulmonary disease, diabetes, obesity, any number of conditions are more likely to progress. And so for those people, your options are, uh, Paxlovid, if you can get it. Uh, unfortunately, we you know we're not so good with the uh, um, the we're not so good with the monoclonals. I would I would say something like this. I would say if you're sick enough to be sick with COVID, maybe you could make the case to your doctor that you are immunocompromised by dint of your age or your prior condition. You know, you have a formally diagnosed immunodeficiency, and you should get outpatient convalescent plasma. Outpatient convalescent plasma is authorized for people with immunodeficiency. Uh, that's, I think, the position I would take. Um, I think probably that's what I would go for if it happened to me. I'm 75. I mean, you know, I could get uh, pretty sick. <clears throat> and um, I think that is, you know, the, the, the two wonderful outpatient trials, the one from Argentina by Lipster et al, uh, was really probably one of the better trials done. I mean, it really, it really reduced uh, progression by 50% at least. And then the second way the, in the US by Sullivan at Hopkins, it's not yet been published, but it's out in the preprint server, uh, much larger, even a larger trial. Again, 50% reduction going to the hospital with outpatient convalescent plasma. It's not authorized for people who are not immuno. Uh, deficient, but the FDA's rule wording on it was uh, not as so exact that you couldn't say grandpa is immunodeficient just because he's grandpa, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I, I think I still like convalescent plasma on an outpatient basis. I used to recommend monoclonals a lot, uh, but now, unfortunately, with Omicron, the monoclonals are not that effective. There will no doubt be engineering vaccines against monoclonals and, uh, sorry, vaccines against Omicron and monoclonals against I'm cry, but that'll take a while. Thank you. Um, on sort of a related note, why is obesity such a great risk factor? In the I'm, not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it's a great risk factor. There's just a lot of people who have obesity, but I, I, it's not It's not huge. In the data I've seen, it's not very large. It, it, it's just one of the factors. I, I think it, a lot of the, uh, among the, uh, the, 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 the things that really seem to make a different formal immunodeficiency is a really big risk factor. In other words, if you have, if you're on cancer chemotherapy, if you've had a, a kidney transplant, that is really, uh, that, that, that really uh, puts you at, at, at risk. And in fact, it puts you interestingly at risk of having a kind of chronic COVID, which is very much improved by convalescent plasma. Uh, even on the inpatient, that may be, a, it's an unusual situation that, 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 that is, in which convalescent plasma is valuable even on the inpatient. So, um, uh, but but every it, it seems as though every uh, general health condition uh, is a bit of you know is a bit of a risk for increasing your risk of 
compared to not having such a condition. Okay, um, there's a question about, um, you graded the CDC, what grade would you give to the FDA? Um, oh, FDA is complicated. Uh, I, and, <laughs> I'll tell you why it's complicated, because we've worked with the FDA directly. Um, and uh, I think in July, was it July of 2020, uh, we, uh, I'm, just trying, I'm trying to get the, the dates right because, you know, I, I seem to have a little pandemic fog here to myself, but last, early in the pandemic, we did a study. I worked with the Mayo Clinic when, when, when the first authorization of convalescent plasma was in March, 2020, but you had to be listed on a registry. FDA said you had to be listed on a registry at the Mayo Clinic. So 100,000 people got convalescent plasma and who were put on a registry. And then in July, it became, they issued an emergency use uh, authorization. So anyone could get it. Now, but only for inpatients, which I, I, I wasn't happy with. Um, the reason they made that decision is because of studies that I and the Mayo Clinic and Hopkins and the FDA participated in looking at whether if you had more antibody in your convalescent plasma, you did better. And you did, absolutely in a stepwise gradient, high, mid, and low, if you were not in a very advanced disease. So this was enough to push the FDA over the edge in the paper that was written about that, that I'm, I'm happy to say I'm a co-author with uh, uh, Peter Marks, uh, head of biologics at the FDA, was a co-author with us. So they were really into, uh, into that. And uh, I think the stewardship of the biological end was very solid, uh, especially in the early going. On the chemical end, which is a separate part of the FDA, they authorized hydroxychloroquine, which they should never have done. Actually, I was going to put in a slide about the FDA, but then I finally decided I couldn't really figure it fully out to give you an answer. So I think um, there were some FDA missteps, uh, but I think I, 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 if I had to give the FDA grade, I'd give it a B in the B range. I think it's done some good things. I only thing I wish, and I've we've talked to Peter Marks about this. He's head of biologics. Can we please, we actually sent him a letter um, just before they approved outpatient convalescent plasma for immunosuppressed people, which was last December, urging him to authorize convalescent plasma. And what he did was only for immunosuppressed people. I wish he had given a broader authorization. We'll, we'll continue to push because I think it's going to be, it could be useful. Uh, it, it's a, you know, convalescent plasma, it's, it's, I learned so much about the blood banking world during this pandemic. I hadn't, you know, all I knew is that when I was a pediatric resident, you go down to the blood bank, get a, get, get a unit, bring it up to the floor, hang it, you know, I mean, a plasma, red cells, platelets, whatever. That's all I knew. I didn't realize that this is this little world inside of medicine that is not operating on the, um, on the profit principle. You know, can you imagine blood, plasma, it's all freely given at no cost, you know? The only uh, money the blood banks make is uh, processing, testing, distributing, you know. Uh, so we give blood, we give blood. This means it doesn't have a big corporation behind it. It doesn't have a big uh, uh, pharma behind it. And uh, so uh, right now, at this very moment, uh, the, 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 the blood bank world is struggling more than it has in many decades. Uh, emergency, I have to say, um, if, if, if anybody of you can give blood or plasma or anything, give it, you know? A lot of us, when we just give blood, the plasma we have might be convalescent plasma anyway, might have antibodies, especially people who've been both vaccinated and had the disease. Those people have sky high antibody levels. Their, their, their convalescent plasma should be great. So, uh, but I think, I think the blood banking world and, and the plasma world, it's really quite a different universe. And it's been, been hard to get support for it in the way I think it, it should have in, in this country. Uh, 
Dr. Pat, there was a question earlier. Um, can there be a unified public health message when the media is so fractured and unregulated? Well, I, I think this, yes, there can be if, the, first of all, you have an intrinsic difficulty in the United States in that most public health regulation is at the state or county level. The CDC really, in fact, even if you have an outbreak of, uh, of something weird in, 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 in Michigan, it first the county health department looks at it. And then the, the county health department needs help, it calls the state health department. And only if the state department calls the CDC can the CDC come in. CDC is at the beck and call of state and local public health. That's the way it's organized. So the CDC is really just a bully pulpit, although they have great data collection uh, possibilities, great study, they can do great studies. They can also provide great expertise. So um, I, I think what is really necessary is for the CD, you know, that the, there should be regular briefings to the public by, this, by the CDC on the status of the pandemic. This is day, this is week 13 of the pandemic. This is the situation. This is where our hot spots are. This is where our cold spots are. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to remember. This is how many people are dying. On regular, consistent, with the same spokespeople uh, talking. Uh, I, I, I always thought um, uh, Anne Schuchat was the best spokesperson the CDC ever had. She was deputy director. Uh, I think she's finished her term with the CDC. She, she was for a while uh, acting director. I wish she could have stayed on. Um, uh, but uh, uh, they, they, they can, there are people who can communicate public health effectively. And we need to have that. And we need, we, I think we have to step, public health officials have to step up. They can't be shy. It's not the time to be shy during a pandemic for public health officials. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question from Dr. Waller. Um, I teach my students that smallpox ed eradication was about the greatest achievement of our species. Why do you think that it is not more celebrated? And why uh, are people like Bill Fouch, Bill Fouch not household? Bill Fagy. I, uh, I completely agree with you, John. I think it's the greatest achievement of humankind. Uh, consider this, this was a disease that killed millions as recently as the 50s, 60s even, millions every year. India would lose 50,000, 100,000 people every year, just India alone. And since 1978, there have been zero cases, last 40 plus years, zero. Can you imagine going from millions of deaths to no deaths at all? And all due to what? Vaccination. And the, 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 the people don't want to recognize this. It just blows my mind. I just, every time an anti-vaxxer wants to talk over Robert Kennedy, I want to say, explain smallpox to me. Why don't we have to worry about smallpox anymore? You know, I give a talk to Madison No, She's the teaching instructor in our introductory epidemiology course I give every spring. I, I review the smallpox eradication campaign, the history of smallpox. I'll be talking about it in March to the undergraduates. We usually have a couple of hundred kids in that class. How many do we have, Madison, this year? 310. Oh, wow, 310. So they'll hear all about smallpox, John. And uh, yes, I wish it would be talked up more, uh, that, that great achievement. I, I talk it up all the time. Uh, but uh, uh, as you say, it seems possible to ignore anything. I mean, I just don't know how people can ignore that massive phenomenon, the complete eradication of a disease entirely through vaccination. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a great story. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for recognizing that, because outside of some, some now public health circles, I really worried that people don't know about this. And I should say, by the way, I entered the United States in 1961 as a teenager. And if I had not had my yellow cart, that showed I was vaccinated against smallpox, I would have been sent right back to Europe. I would not have, or I would have, they would have said, you can, you can take the shot now, it can head back on the next boat back. That, there was absolutely no, there was no, um, no, 
there was no issue at all. There was there was no public concern about it. Every single person who entered the United States by airplane, by boat, crossing the border had to have evidence of smallpox vaccination or they did not come in. There were hundreds of inspectors in the 60s, as going back to the 60s, hundreds of them. Uh, we've just forgotten that. We've just completely put it out of our mind uh, and pretended that it didn't happen. It's astonishing. Uh, we Public health decides to save money. Uh, infections weren't a problem anymore. We eradicated smallpox. Infections are not the trouble. Let's get rid of all those quarantine stations. There were 200, 320 quarantine stations in the US and the largest one in New York had 90 inspectors. We have none of that anymore. Practically down, it's down to seven, I think it's seven quarantine stations or something like that. And I don't know, there was built up recently to 20, but still nothing like what we had because we recognize the value of vaccination. And uh, once smallpox was eradicated, sadly, uh, we were, people managed to kind of forget about all the great value of vaccination. Um, in Europe, some 511 protocol is to separate the two vaccines by eight weeks, but this field differs. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite hear you, Shruti. Um, can you hear me better now? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, in Euro, some 511 protocol is to separate the two vaccines by eight weeks, but this period differs from country to country. Um, could you discuss the difference in protocol between I, countries? Yeah, I, I don't think you know. It's I don't think it's very well established what the exact time difference is, or the time to a booster, or time to the next booster after the first booster. These are all, um, a pro you know, people do a study and they, when they begin the study, they say, what do you think, Joe, six weeks between shots, eight weeks? You know, they try to make their best estimates and then it becomes fixed uh, as if no other alternative is possible. But so we don't do studies to say, let's try the second one at five weeks, the second one at six weeks, the second one. So we don't do that. So we don't really know. So these variations are bound to occur and they're based on judgment. You can look at antibody status in people after, uh, after the, um, they've been vaccinated, but even antibody status has a, an approximate, not an absolute relationship to resistance to infection. Uh, <clears throat> uh, or, and, and then the one, the antibody tests that really are most clearly related to protection against infection are a little bit costly and difficult to do. Um, here's one more question. It seems clear that vaccination did not used to be politicized as now, but I'm afraid that in the current climate, other vaccines will also be politicized. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the anti-vaccine movement didn't exist when I was in training. I mean, we gave, you know, pediatrics, what you give shots, that's what you do all day. <laughs> you make sure kids are immunized and, uh, uh, there was no, I don't remember anybody when I was in training some 40 years ago, anybody raising any issues about vaccination. And then steadily, slowly, it, it began with kind of, I think in the 1990s mostly, with uh, the idea that autism was caused by the measles vaccine. And the data upon which this was based were nonsensical. And in fact, the the famous paper in the Lancet was had to be withdrawn and the author had to be, Wakefield had to be uh, removed from the lists of British physicians. And then he set up shop in Texas and began his poisonous screeds uh, from here. And, and then certain people just picked up on it. Uh, movie stars or uh, people like uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Hart, you know, people whose names resonate, unfortunately. And I have no idea where it came from, what the, what the social, it's a sociological phenomenon that deserves study, but it didn't exist. And it's part of a, of a kind of resistance to authority that I think has emerged, but I think it has its own dynamic and I don't understand it, I wish I did.
You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the response to the polio vaccine, by the way, the polio, the, the result of the polio trial, the salt polio trial, was that polio was about 70% effective, the, the vaccine. Not 95%, not like Pfizer. 70%. And yet it was welcomed as if it was a gift of God. That everybody was, was celebrating. Generally, I, I can't remember what the figure was. It was 5 million kids were vaccinated against polio in the first week after the announcement. I mean, people begged. They would stand in line for it. Uh, in fact, I, I gave measles vaccines as a medical student in, Gua- in rural Guatemala, and I saw mothers bring their babies walking for hours, coming at midnight to a vaccination statement to get, the, say, to get their kids vaccinated against measles. Where this antipathy to vaccination came from, come from, I don't know. It's not part of the culture I grew up in. Right. Thank you, Dr. Panos. Um, there's one more really interesting question, which was asked a while ago. Um, if you were looking forward to the next pandemic, what should we advocate to prepare for it? We need we need to do a lot of things. And, and there will, by the way, there will be a next pandemic. It's not what it's not if but when. I think we should really, really, I think there needs to be a detailed exploration of the lessons of this pandemic, what we did right, what we did wrong. I think we need to be in advance, be ready with uh, tools, have our toolboxes ready, ready to develop vaccines, monoclonals, convalescent plasma, uh, uh, ready to be able to up, uh, to increase our, 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 our medical, ICU capacity, our hospital capacity. I didn't talk about that. I felt I didn't really know enough about the details to say much about it. Uh, And also early warning systems and control of borders. I I think, you know, it was astounding to me how slowly uh, the Trump administration responded to to border controls, even, you know, uh, especially from Europe. And, and then when they when it happened, they just, they mixed every, they put people together in big groups. I mean, it was just so poorly done. We need to have figure out how best to uh, prevent people from seeding infection from one place to another. And we need to think about it sensibly and logically and calmly and, uh, uh, and we need to have a policy about it. You know? So there's so many things that have to be done. Uh, I think the president, I think President Biden ought to appoint a, point, a, a kind of a, a working group, a task force to think about this, think about the next pandemic. I know Mike Osterholm, who is, talks all the time, he's a talking head on TV, he's a friend. He's been talking about this for a very long time. And uh, there are others too who, who really have thought about this carefully. My colleague Arturo Casadevall at Hopkins. And uh, if we got the right people in the room, we could come up with a good blueprint for the next time around. But the federal government would have to respect it. I mean, they would have to listen. They would have to say, yes, we are going to let the CDC people direct public policy. We are going to let uh, uh, the people who know uh, be in charge. Uh, but we, we don't seem to live in that kind of a political atmosphere, right? Sadly. Thank you. Um, uh, this is from I, I wonder how you'd have graded the playbook that Obama's admin had put together about response to the inevitable pandemic. Yes, there was. You know, that's a very good question. I didn't, I remember looking at some of that stuff. The Obama uh, had done something like that, had planned it. I think it ought to be taken off the shelf and re- revisited now. Uh, I, I, I wish I, I could give you an, uh, an, an, an educated response to that. I, I knew a little bit about it. Uh, I, knew, I think I knew at the time some of the things that were said that were not done, but I don't have the, uh, a, full, uh, a full grasp of what was recommended. But I, I think the first step, if we were to move forward, would be to pull that one out off the shelf and look at it. That would be a first step. I do know there was such a a planning effort. And thanks for reminding me that there was, because when I made my comments a moment ago, I hadn't been thinking of that. 
And um, which countries were most successful in dealing with the pandemic and what can we learn? A long list, a long list. I think in the early days, I mentioned South Korea uh, um, and Taiwan. Uh, they had some extraordinary things. They, Taiwan was particularly noted for its ability to track down infections using cell phone technologies. <clears throat> they all use testing a lot. <clears throat> the pre-vaccine period, uh, uh, a lot of Southeast Asian countries did very, very well. In the post-vaccine period, it was a matter of getting vaccination rates up. Now, who's been very good at that? New Zealand, Australia, some of the Nordic countries, not all of them. Sweden is an outlier. Sweden decided, oh, they, they had this kind of herd immunity idea, you know, let people get sick. Well, they had four times the death rate of Norway. If you like that, that's fine, you know. I mean, these people who, who, who believe in just letting nature take its course and let, uh, let's develop natural antibodies. Yes, but what price do you pay? We lost, we lost nearly a million people. Uh, if we had done that, we'd not vaccinated, not done preventive measures, might be more like five to six million people. You know, I, I don't know why that doesn't resonate with people, but, you know, we have among the highest mortality rates in the world. Our mortality rate is at least 10 times that of Japan. Why should this be? You know, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it's just, a and J Japan, by the way, was laid into the vaccine game too, nonetheless. Um, I, I, I think there are a lot of there are a lot of lessons to be learned from what other countries did. I think uh, the ones uh, both with contact tracing and testing early, and good public health messaging, very strong public health messaging, and then later once we had a vaccine, with really getting that vaccine out there distributed and accepted. So I think in New Zealand, where they're over ninety percent vaccinated, you know, of eligibles, uh, well over ninety percent. It can be done. We don't have to suffer the death rates we suffer. It's our right. choice. We have all the tools. We have the tools we need to control this epidemic. We just don't choose to use them. Right. And um, what about Canada? Canada's done up and down. Canada is much like the U.S. in many ways. It, uh, it also has provinces. It also has people who are fiercely independent, as we like to say. Nobody's going to put a mask on me kind of people. And um, uh, so they've had, they've had up and now they were late to get the vaccine too. And so it's, it's hard to, they didn't do as well as, as much better than we did. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's uh, obviously some, some countries have advantages, some have more congested, more, more packed in population, some have less. There are many factors in there, but I think an analysis could be done in which we would see who did very well, who did not so well, and what can we learn from that for the next time? And it, we're speaking about it as, as, uh, as you hear, we kind of, I'm speaking as if the pandemic is over. It's not over by any means, but I'm a little bit hopeful, a little bit hopeful that the Omicron might be the last big wave uh, and uh, increasing levels of immunity, both from natural infection and vaccination are steadily, very slowly climbing up, not as fast as we would wish. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we might be over the hump soon because this is very, this has been a very distressing epidemic. Although I said to, said to somebody the other day, um, in the last, I just, if you want to pick 30, I've been in Michigan for 31 years. So what terrible things have happened in the last 31 years? Uh, the COVID epidemic of the last two years. Let's take another period of 31 years, 1914 to 1945. My parents went through that period of time. Jenny Banks' parents went through that period of time. 1914 to 1945 was nothing but war, world war, and economic depression, that entire 31 years. So, you know, you've had it easy. Let's be frank. We have had it very easy compared to what, 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 what went on earlier in the 20th century. Uh, uh, world wars, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, someone said to me, I can't, I can't take any more years of this pandemic, it's been two years already. I said, yeah, World War II lasted six years. Well, what would happen if in two years we'd said, okay, we're gonna go home, throw it all up, Never mind. let Hitler have what he wants. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a hard life, yeah. It is hard, life is hard.
Um, I see only one more question that's not been answered yet. Um, there is a new variant of Omicron, uh, B14, now in Scandinavia and in the US. What do you know about it? I have just heard about that. There might be a new, a new variant of Omicron. A variant of Omicron, which they haven't given a new Greek letter to, suggests that it's a minor deviation from what was going on before. Again, I can hope we can hope that there won't be such such rapid mutation rates that we will get into trouble. I think, in my experience, the, the co this co coronavirus uh, story is distinct because I don't think we've seen a rapidly mutating, highly communicable aerosolized virus that is perennial, not seasonal. Um, you know, we used to say, you know, flu has, has, has a summertime to get, you know, organized in, in China or East Asia and, 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 and re re reorganize itself and come back to infect the rest of the world. Uh, this, is, this has not been seasonal. You know, it didn't it didn't dry up in the summer, and uh, even polio was was seasonal. It was only in the summer, so this lack of seasonality doesn't give us a break. You know, um, uh, but but uh, the the nineteen eighteen flu also is still known. But we wrote a uh, um, uh, Siddharth Chandra and I uh, and some others wrote a paper on this. Uh, the nineteen eighteen flu had four waves in Michigan. And, and the last wave was the worst, and it was in 1920. So things can go on. And they, they did in the past, too. But still, I'm, I'm still hopeful that we might, we might be past the, the worst of it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Panos, for your time. Okay, uh, this well, discussion was very interesting. I thanks, everybody, for you. listening. And... Uh, I uh, appreciate all the questions and, uh, you know, you can probably email me questions also, Panath at MSU. All right. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Oh, well, thanks. And That's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. We have the largest group here tonight we've ever had, 65 people. So we're thrilled. Please pass the word about how wonderful this program is. And thanks again, Nigel. I just want to remind everybody that next week we will convene with our featured speaker, Dr. Kelly Salchow MacArthur, who is with the Department of Art, Art History and Design. And her topic will be Together in Sport, Graphic Design and Athletics Converge at the Olympic Agora. Should be interesting. Thank wow. you again. Take care, everyone. Thanks. So good to see you. Thank you. It's wonderful.